Welcome everybody to our seventh annual roundtable, uh, uh, Alliance Roundtable on how CEOs are using AI. I'm, I'm Paul Whitke, founder of the Alliance of CEOs. Uh, we've been doing these since May and uh, taking your input each time and uh, just reporting the, the, the feedback you guys have given us. Uh, the usage among the group here has uh, grown 10% from uh, 70 percent uh, in May to 77 percent now are using AI in your businesses. So there's still 23 percent that aren't using AI in any way in their businesses. And uh, of those of you who are finding positive results, it's, 50, it's grown from 50 percent to 55 percent. So just slow growth of the of the experimentation, but we're learning. So today we're going to discuss how CEOs are using no code AI agents to improve marketing operations. Our facilitator, Matthew Swanson, managing partner of Silicon Valley Software Group, will once again share a few tips that he's been learning. Uh, and he'll also welcome today's guest, CEO, Arjun Saxena, CEO of Humanic AI. So thank you for joining us today, Arjun. Look forward to hearing uh, about uh, your experiences and uh, sharing them with us. So with that, uh, take it away, Matthew. All right. Well, thanks, Paul. And uh, yeah, we're going to continue on this topic of AI agents. Uh, we've been talking about agents for the past couple of sessions, and the category is really gaining steam. Um, if anyone caught Salesforce's Dreamforce last week, they actually dubbed it Agent Force. Um, so they're they're making a really hard position into using agents uh, for all of uh, Salesforce's feature set. Uh, so now it's you know it's not just startups claiming that AI agents are going to up-end sales and marketing. Uh, we now have the biggest SaaS vendor going all in on the topic, which makes it you know, extra uh, important to, to pay attention to. So on that note, uh, today we're gonna focus on how non-tech companies and non-technical business users can think about using agents today. Uh, we're gonna hear from Arjun Saxena, who will share his experiences uh, building no-code AI agent tools for marketing teams. Um, but per usual, we're going to start off with a, a quick illustration of what AI agents can do today. And for that, I'm going to share my screen and show a video of an AI agent in action. So um, what you're seeing here is a console um, uh, of an internal tool that we use at Silicon Valley Software Group. We use this for sales and marketing. And we use it, um, this is a, essentially a, a layer on top of our AI agent that we've built. Um, and the first thing to note is we've ditched the GUI and we just talk to our agent. We use, we use prompts. So I'm gonna just run through a quick uh, example well, of- Matthew, of I'm not able to see anything. Oh no. Yeah, is Jeannie? Yeah, I'm able I'm to see your screen just fine. Is there anyone else that's having problems seeing? Nothing, there's nothing happening on the screen. I mean, you see the screen, but there's nothing on the screen except yeah. SVG. Yeah, so yeah, you're seeing a blank about, screen. Right. Yeah. We're just gonna we're we're gonna get into it. At the very bottom, you see this prompt. This is what we're gonna run through. Uh, I'm typing in create a LinkedIn single image ad using these campaign details. And basically what's happening in the background is there's a, there's a Word document that has campaign details in it. And our agent is able to look at this command and figure out what to do. So when I hit play here, I enter the command and the agent, uh, if, if you remember last time, anyone who joined that session, we showed a tool called Multion, which can navigate the internet. So this agent has access to that tool it figures out that it should use that tool. And you're gonna see it, it loads a browser and it goes to LinkedIn to start performing its command. So another thing to, to highlight here is the agent is, we're treating it just like an employee. It has its own email address. It has its own phone number. So it can log in and authenticate just like an employee would. And in fact, this is a really cool. So we were running a bunch of these campaigns and the agent saw a CAPTCHA and actually filled that out on its own. And, and you know, 
this is just, we, we didn't have to do anything custom. Uh, this is this is just what agents can do nowadays, which is pretty incredible. So it finishes the authentication process, and then it gets here, which is it, you know if anyone's ever tried to create a LinkedIn ad, ad campaign, you know it's a pretty complicated flow. It's about thirty some odd clicks, and if you get any of them wrong, your ad spend blows up. So uh, what's happening here is the agent has uh, a file it's looking at of what are the steps to take uh, to perform this task. Uh, but the, the steps are written in plain English. Like, you know, this is, uh, you'll see it, it created uh, a campaign and, you know, it's been instructed to create a campaign and it's figuring out what buttons to click on to do that. Similarly, it's been told that um, the goal is to drive traffic to a landing page. So it, it figures out which one of these options to choose on its own. And you'll see it continues to figure out how to click around on the right things uh, just by the, the prompts that it's been fed. And, and you know what, what I'm really trying to illustrate here is how complicated, how sophisticated these flows can be there, there's a lot of clicks that it's doing, um, and it, it's all based Let off of a couple of questions. Um, sorry for interrupting you, but number one, uh, you, you kind of admitted the whole um, uh, uploading the file. How did you upload the file uh, to this? So like, is, was this was this done? Did I miss it, or where is that file itself? Yeah, we're uh, we're trying to keep this brief, just to just to kind of show what can happen. Happy to answer answer those questions at the end if we have time. Um, but the the main thing to emphasize is that you know with a bunch of Word documents that have prompts in it, agents can now read them, go perform actions on the internet. They can click around tools like LinkedIn or Salesforce or what have you, just like your employees would. The other really, I think notable thing is if anyone here is familiar with robotic process automation from the past, you know, this is essentially one of the use cases that's emerging, which is instead of having to go inside of a GUI and set up this workflow and then maintain it over time, agents now, what we did here is we asked our agent to go read LinkedIn tutorials on how to create an ad campaign. It came back with a, a document with steps we went and edited it, and now it's performing it on its own. And it knows to look at LinkedIn for updates, and it notifies us whenever there is an update that it's it's made change it's made changes to. Um, so the paradigm is shifting on how you can think about using AI agents to automate tasks that traditionally would have required a lot of upkeep. So we're going to. But the question that being was asked was a very relevant question which I think should be answered. Otherwise, we can follow along the demo. What was the Please input ask. to the agent? Uh, we see the output of the agent. We don't know the understand yeah. the input to the agent. Yeah, a lot you, of you what- one command, a lot of what, the, you, it was a reference uh, to a document. That you use, this document use this document, but how do you supply yeah, that? Where's document? the document? How do you use it? You have to show it uh, to us. Uh, well, uh, you can reach out and I'll give you the the, the full demo. Uh, you know, unfortunately, this, this is really just a, a quick window. I, well, I'd be happy to share with anyone, um, you know, what this campaign details document contains, but that's essentially what it's what it's reading. But where um, does it sit? How, how, how does it know where to access it? It's in Notion. It's in a, uh, a, a essentially a document store. So it's not in a database. It's in a, you know, this could be Microsoft Word. It could be anything you use today. And it's there's no to pointer to that document in this command. Uh, correct. Come on, give the guy a break. Let's just let him go forward. So, While we press so, him. Uh, I mean, those are all, those are all emphasizing though, what's different here. You don't have to make explicit load this document type of commands. You can, um, you can type in natural language and have the agent figure out how to navigate a file structure, pull the right documents, et cetera. So we're going to have to leave it at that for now. Uh, please ask any questions in the Q&A. We'll try to get to them at the end. But we're going to turn our attention now uh, to our guest, Arjun, who is going to share some of his insights 
on creating agents for marketing teams. And uh, to kick things off here, so you know, Arjun uh, is the founder of, of, uh, of Humanic, uh, creating marketing automation tools. Uh, Arjun, you've had, you've had a background working at, in both large enterprise and startups. Uh, you've seen many technology waves over the past two decades. Let's start with uh, just a brief background on how did you arrive at Humanic? Sure. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Matthew, for that and, and Paul for inviting me. Uh, so I'm Arjun Saxena. I'm based here in the Bay Area for a number of decades. And uh, I worked, like Matthew said, in Yahoo and Adobe for over 20 years um, in product and engineering roles. I was head of growth for Photoshop and Illustrator, where we had 400 million users. Uh, worked a lot with marketing because Adobe is marketing and, and creative. And one of the things that I was charged with at uh, uh, you know, early on with uh, Photoshop and, and Creative Cloud is to figure out uh, how do we activate a lot of people that come into Photoshop and can, don't continue to use it. So this is one thing that is very common for SaaS businesses that they get a lot of people to sign up. And after they sign up, which may indicate some intent, uh, they don't activate. They don't continue to use the product. So this was a very big problem uh, at Adobe and Figma and Canva were eating Adobe's lunch, specifically Photoshop. Uh, and there was a whole team that was set up just to take care of this problem. So there was, you know, all this data that we had uh, of who was using what. Uh, we had a whole team of 40 machine learning engineers trying to figure out uh, how to segment those users and how to run a very effective multi-channel nudge campaign uh, to, you know, uh, drive positive outcomes. So I was there, then I was also at Evernote doing very similar things. Evernote in that time also had a similar problem, 200 plus users, a lot of data, but not enough activation. So Humanic stands for human plus machine. Uh, we started this a couple of years ago and it is generalizing using uh, LLMs, large language models and AI agents, um, the ability to run um, activation campaigns at scale. So if I break it down, like anytime you send an email, you need to figure out who to send, what to send, and when to send. Uh, these are agents within Humanic that talk to each other and create your entire lifecycle marketing campaign for you. Uh, so similar to what Matt showed, you can use prompts and you can say, I want to send uh, you know, these uh, emails to these kinds of people and the system will automatically uh, utilize these agents to create the entire campaign for you. Makes so, a ton of sense. Uh, it, 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 and Arjun, I think, I think you're, you're starting to, to get into the meat of things, which is, you know, we're seeing a, a paradigm shift, right? The questions from earlier were great. People were at, like, how is, how is this happening? Right. And, and this is something that's, ha this is why agents are so exciting because you can start to do things that in the past just would have, wouldn't have been, been possible if you had to explicitly define each action you want to take. And so maybe, you know, uh, before we get into the weeds here, um, let, let, you know, let's uh, address some of the, the broader question. Many people, you know, are just getting acquainted with AI agents and you just finished hosting a two-day event here in the city, here in San Francisco, uh, centered around AI agents and marketing. Um, I attended, learned a ton, uh, saw some really interesting use cases. Um, maybe you can start with uh, a bird's eye perspective about the, the agent landscape. You know, what were some notable agent use cases that you're seeing gaining traction? Absolutely. So let me begin by uh, sharing my screen if that's okay. So very high level, um, you know, what's happening, Naeem and, and others who were uh, asking about agents. If you look at it, at the bottom layer, we have what are called foundation models. So if, if you are, you know, most of us are familiar, but OpenAI, Anthropic, Mistral, and there's like a dozen uh, or so large language models, which are foundation models, which take large amounts of uh, investment, both in uh, GPUs and infrastructure and training and lots of gobs and gobs of data uh, to create these foundation models 
that can do these amazing things. So these are large language models. This is what came out of uh, Google, essentially DeepMind. And now a lot of the folks uh, moved to OpenAI, some of them moved to Anthropic, and, but the genesis of all of those uh, people is still uh, Google DeepMind, like they can trace it back to there. Uh, so now we are in the era where we are in the business of programming large language models. So if you go back 30 years, uh, there were, you know, a lot of us probably that were in, in tech, there was assembly language coding where you would, uh, we were taught to program chips. And now you don't hear of assembly language anymore because we have higher abstractions like C, C++, Python, et cetera, that allow you to uh, program without having to do lower level programming. We are yet again in a phase where there are these foundation models and we are trying to program foundation models, which is through this concept of agents. Uh, and there are three layers to it. One is the full code layer. So you can program foundation models using you know, native libraries like DSPy, which came out of Stanford, Langchain, there are a bunch of them. Um, and that are, these are the ones that are pretty popular. On top of that, if you are, don't want to do full code, there are low code uh, constructs like Crew AI, which is an open source uh, thing. And then there is Autogen, which comes out of Microsoft. Uh, so this allows you to, makes it simpler for you to uh, program an LLM. And I'll get into what I mean by programming LLM and uh, 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 create these agents and, and connect them together. And then there are these no-code tools. So at the top level, you have things like Clay that does Dimension, Tome, which is content, Humanic, which is building activation, you know, many other types of uh, vertical things that have been, uh, you know, that have been built to do several marketing uh, use cases. Does that make sense? Arjun, that was a great illustration. And I think that layering um, is a helpful way of looking at things. Uh, you can use AI in a number of different ways. You can get very technical and very deep. But now there's a there's a, a set of layers that have have emerged to open up uh, use cases for uh, non-technical folks. And you know, going back to you know your experience at the conference uh, the other day, you know, can can you uh, give us a couple examples, uh, one or two examples of sure. what you can do with AI agents? Absolutely. So uh, I would go to so this is a, uh, a very simple market map that we created. Um, so if you think of the use cases, the no code pieces, there is you know, traditional marketing automation for that many of you are familiar with like Marketo, Iterable, Braze. Um, all of these companies are now that, you know, there are probably a dozen marketing automation companies and they are using a construct that, you know, I described earlier where they're, using agents to construct or basically um, they, are, they are using agents to um, do a certain task. So you give it an input like Matthew was showing, you they do a certain task and they generate an output. So the narrower the agent definition is, the better fidelity it will have. And you take the output of one agent and then you give it to another agent. So the agents are chained together in a workflow that are each doing certain tasks. And the, the, the big shift is that these agents don't, you don't need to learn a specific language to program these agents. These agents can be programmed by writing in English, which, act, which is basically just prompts. So you can give, an, uh, give, an, uh, give a prompt uh, and, a, uh, and a certain amount of data and ask it to do certain things. It does that, it generates an output, you can review it, uh, and then you can give it to another agent. So that's the basic construct. And through that, you can create, you can do all of marketing automation that a number of companies are doing. Then there are certain categories that have emerged. So signal-based selling is a big, big category. So um, this is part marketing, part sales, but basically collecting all your signals, whether you're on the website, whether you're, you know, you're getting some webinars or, you know, events and collecting that data, enriching that data, and then driving outbound, uh, you know, turn multi-channel touch points is signal-based scaling, scoring, all of these complex different workflows. And I'll show you an example of that. Um, 
can be done. And a bunch of companies have emerged in that space. So I think that's a new space mm -hmm. that has emerged that wasn't uh, possible to do in a scalable way before AI agents. No, um, it, it, that's very interesting, Arjun. And, and it, you know, I just want to make sure this, this uh, kind of drives home the point with, with a tangible use case. I think you gave a nice depiction of the process and kind of, uh, you know, some of the broader uh, categories like um, scoring leads, right? But maybe, you know, uh, what's a typical situation a, a CEO here might want to pay attention to? Would they go to their, you know, marketing team and ask, you know, kind of what kind of questions would they need to ask to determine where they should be applying AI agents? So one big uh, you know area as a CEO that you can apply AI agents is content generation. So let's say you know repurposing content. So you had a webinar, you had some sort of podcast or recording. There's a whole bunch of companies that is in the next layer, which is AI and content generation. Like Goldcast is a good one, Tofu is a good one, where you could use AI to generate multiple variations. What AI is really good at is generating multiple variations uh, of a piece of content. So if you're a CEO and you want to, uh, you know, one of the low hanging fruits is to start using it in your audio, video, text, um, sort of uh, content generation. And, and I wouldn't say content generation as much as content repurposing. So if you have, you know, lots of um, content that you've created, uh, whether um, you can do a lot by using these uh, tools that are no code tools, uh, that can do that. Uh, some One of the other applications, which is a little more technical, is the AI and SEO, which is something that you should definitely look at uh, to drive more inbound traffic and you know, extending the reach uh, of uh, you know, your content. Uh, so those two, I would say, are good starting points uh, um, for any CEO that wants to uh, take a look at that. And then as you get deeper into marketing, uh, there are many different use cases uh, that can be explored. Almost all use cases are getting AI enabled or you know AI powered. Right. Going back to the you know the start here where we talked about Dreamforce, really uh, Salesforce going all in on agents because you know they're you know what they're what they're claiming and what the industry is 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 gravitating toward is is exactly what you just said, Arjun. You know name your use case and you can start to do things differently with an AI agent assistant. But if, you know, uh, one of the challenges a lot of folks are going to have are, is, you know, where to get started. You gave a couple pointers on use cases. So I think that was, you know, helpful to hear, you know, uh, relatable. I mean, those, those use cases you shared, almost any company uh, probably has some version of that in their business. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, setting these up, right? So part of you know the, the focus here is no code ways of, of getting started. Um, you know, what are the technical requirements? If I'm a CEO of a mid-market enterprise, what team members do I need to assemble to start exploring these agents? Um, so you need, um, you know, obviously um, some data that, that you might have, but in terms of team members, uh, you can have a technical marketeer or you can have uh, one person who understands how to uh, create these workflows. And I can give you an example of that. Uh, so here is one example of a simple agent that does, uh, you know, generates in, uh, one second. An email, let's say you want to generate an email. A simple agent looks like this, where uh, if you can see, there are few things that, that are being input into the agent. So I think somebody was asking earlier. So you can create a simple Excel sheet or a Notion document, Airtable, where you provide the name, the strategy, delay, uh, you know, that you want to send out some business information, pricing information. All of these are configurable and then create an agent to generate an email. So you can have a prompt, you can select the model. Uh, and these are very simple things to do for a semi-technical uh, programmer or somebody who's not extremely advanced, but like a junior programmer is good enough, as long as you can guide them with the business decisions. 
And very simply, you can create uh, these kinds of workflows. Many tools exist to create these kinds of workflows and no code tools exist also. So this is, for example, a sub -like subject line um, generator, which generates a email body top, middle, bottom, combines them together, and you, know, you can publish this out. So there are global variables you can set. So in many cases, you know, you would go into settings and you will, you know, uh, set up these workspace variables where you have the information, the tone on voice, you know, which domain they are going after. So many tools already have these global variables, but most tools work off of uh, simple um, uh, cloud uh, Excel sheets, which is basically Airtable. Got it. So you can put all of your content uh, in an Airtable. Uh, which is Excel in the cloud, essentially very simply. Use cert, uh, a particular workflow tool that I showed. There are plenty of them, Zapier, Make, uh, AirOps, a bunch of them, to connect the data that you have and uh, you know, uh, massage in it in, in a way um, that you want. So if you are completely non-technical, I think you will need somebody who understands how to very simply connect an Airtable to any kind of system that allows you to do a workflow and have the experiment, you know, do a bunch of iterations to generate the content that looks good to you. But you Excellent. can use that. Yeah, you can use that in any of your uh, marketing activities. Yeah, and you know, we are seeing a bunch of of companies doing this. Um, I think that way of framing it of you know um, Microsoft Excel in the cloud. There's a lot of tools using that as the new interface. So in a previous session, we showed Clay. Uh, if uh, folks were here for that, where, you know, it's, just, it's, it's like a spreadsheet and you go and you enter prompts and it's able to um, perform some, some pretty sophisticated flows. But I want to, I want to, in our last three minutes here, kind of get into, you know, so oh, that's where God. things are. And that's, uh, you know, as you just alluded to, Arjun, still requires some sort of assistance, right? If I'm a CEO here, I'm gonna to have to pull in a team member or an expert in one of these tools, um, but let's peer one year in the future, or you know, um, some some time into the future. At what point, you know, will we be able to simply talk to these agents and have it help us just like our employees do? Yeah, one last thing I would say before we move on to answering the question: if most of you are familiar with Photoshop, uh, I would say that. Uh, building agents, et cetera, you could do it on your own. But just like Photoshop, if you wanted to, if you ever tried Photoshop or Figma, it takes a you know, number of hours to exactly get it right. You can do it, but it takes a number of hours to train and uh, train yourself or learn something on YouTube. But ideally, it's not a good use of your time. So it's best to get a designer who knows Photoshop inside out and they know where to click and what happens. So these workflows are very similar, like they can be done, you can learn it, but uh, depending on your time, you know, and, and how interested you are in doing kinds of things, uh, a junior developer or somebody uh, can help you with that. To answer your question, I think it's very, um, it's very hard to say where we'll be, where we'll be. Uh, it's uh, one thing I'd say, even though Salesforce is all into agent force and everything, this is not robust yet. Uh, this is not something that is production quality. There is still uh, a lot of um, hallucination or loss that happens uh, in the last. Uh, another analogy I can give is just like you talk to Siri or Alexa and they, you know, they're like 95% accurate, uh, but it's hard to talk to them because you're expecting 100% accuracy uh, when you talk to an, you know, uh, uh, any kind of Siri or Alexa. Similarly, these agents are, have, when you start, creating this workflow, um, they, they lose fidelity, which is called hallucination, like they start thinking on their own. Uh, so they're not production ready yet. There is a lot of human intervention required. And it's actually um, only makes start to make sense when you're trying to do this at um, a, a large scale or you're setting, a, uh, setting yourself up for doing this at scale. So in terms of answering your question about where it is, I think OpenAI and Anthropic are going to release a whole bunch of things in the next six months. Uh, how much of this they uh, pack within the foundation models versus how much of they, they leave outside uh, is very hard to say, but their intent obviously is to do, go towards AGI, uh, you know, artificial general intelligence. Uh, they are trying their best to do that. There is all kinds of politics that's going, going on in real time around that open AI uh, and, uh, 
it's very hard to say where this will be. This will continue to be something that we get a lot of investment, a lot of excitement about in the next couple of years. But it's hard to say how much of it will be, uh, you know, just click and play versus, uh, you know, creating essentially more jobs for people to manage this beast. Right. I, I guess that's what the venture capitalists will bet on. Um, so we'll be covering this as we go. And um, but I think we are at a time. I saw there were some great questions in there. I wish wish we could uh, address them, but we'll have to save it for another time, maybe in the breakout sessions. Paul, you want to lead us in? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for joining us, Arjun. And uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, we're now going to go into a break into small